there was ever a time when men and women who cherish the ideals of the founders of the British and American constitutions should take counsel with one another at that time is now. These are the words spoken by Sir Winston Churchill, perhaps one of the greatest orators of the 20th century. We chose Winston Churchill, and in particular his speech, In Defense of Freedom and Peace, given on October 16, 1938, because his thoughts turned into words had the ability to unite nations and inspire victory. Alexander the Great remarked that the peoples of Asia were slaves because they had not learned to pronounce the word no. Let that not be the epitaph of the English-speaking people, or of parliamentary democracy, or of France, or of the many surviving liberal states of Europe. There, in one single word, is the resolve which the forces of freedom and progress, tolerance and goodwill, there is the resolve which they should take. It is not in the power of one nation. However, to the British and American people just before Germany began nightly bombing attacks over England. It was made to help alleviate the fears of the British people and as a plea to the Americans to fight, for the for fight the forces of tyranny and oppression. At a time when England stood virtually alone, he arose as one of Britain's all-time greatest war leaders. Now let's take a few minutes to break down the components of this speech so you can have a better understanding of why Churchill was considered a master of the spoken word. We will first discuss the significance of this speech, Next, we will discuss the various communication concepts Churchill used in his speeches. Lastly, we would like to try to convey to you why Churchill was such an inspiration to our group. Churchill had been the commander of uh, the British Navy during the First World War. However, during the time of this speech in the late 1930s, Churchill was out of public office and out of favor with the people of England. The Second World War has, yet, has not yet started, but Churchill is very outspoken about Germany's conquest of Czechoslovakia and the reign of terror caused by Hitler's Nazi party. A year after this speech, Britain declares war on Germany, and Churchill again is made Lord of the Admiralty. One year later, in 1940, Churchill becomes Prime Minister of Britain. The speech was delivered for the benefit of the American public and is famously sometimes referred to as We Must Arm Speech in which Churchill attempts to persuade America and the rest of the Allies to rise up arms and crush Hitler's war machine. The speech by, per by Churchill is both persuasive and very interesting. He starts the speech by saying, I avail myself with relief of the opportunity of speaking to the people of the United States. I do not know how long such liberties will be allowed. The stations of uncensored expression are closing down. The lights are going out. But there is still time for those whom to whom freemen and parliamentary government mean something, to consult together. Let me then speak the truth in earnestness while time remains. The point of this opening statement is to grab the attention of the listener and convince them that without action, Hitler's Nazi Germany will overtake the world and take away the freedoms that the American people are accustomed to if action is not taken right, right away. Churchill is a master of the rhetorical question, and he uses it often to keep the listener involved. He asks, one may put this question in the largest form. Has any benefit or progress ever been achieved by the human race by submission to organized and calculated violence? He answers the question by speaking of resistance to tyranny and injustice while weaving in Christian values, which he knows are very important to the American listener. Churchill now juxtaposes the American culture with the reality of Hitler's Nazi principles and culture and role, stating, we are confronted with another theme. It is not a new theme. It is a theme that leaps out from, to us from the dark ages. 
racial persecution, religious intolerance, deprivation of speech. The conception of citizen as a mere soulless fraction of the state. The purpose of this part of the speech is to excite the listener to the horrible possibilities and also as a scare tactic. Up to this point in history, Nazi Germany is known as a bad political entity, but one that is thousands of miles away. In an era, I remind you, that still does not have jetliners that can transport people across Europe. It is, Germany has only invaded Czechoslovakia so far and cannot really threaten America. To reinforce his opinion, Churchill needs to relate Nazi Germany to a known quantity for the American listener to understand and clearly see that the threat is coming. So he uses the worst thing that an American of the time fears, and that fear is communism. Churchill is absolutely brilliant when he says, like the communists, the Nazi tolerate no opinion but their own. Like the communists, they feed on hatred. Like the communists, they must seek from time to time, and always at shorter intervals, a new target, a new prize, a new victim. Churchill, following the format of a persuasive speech, has stated the problem, Nazism, the cause, Hitler and his war machine, and now states the solution. He says in his very distinct and polished voice that the preponderant world forces are upon our side. They have but to be combined to be obeyed. We must arm. Britain must arm. America must arm. If the, through an earnest desire for peace we have placed ourselves at a disadvantage, we must make up for it by redoubled exertions and, if necessary, by fortitude and suffering. His point here is that the mass of the countries who oppose Hitler, the Allied forces, simply outnumber the Nazis. And even though the Allies' initial desire for peace has given Hitler an advantage, they must redouble their efforts if it even means fighting to the death in order to stop this mess. Churchill concludes his speech, concludes his speech by restating his points in a way that is positive and warms the heart of the American listener. First, he is offering hope by reassuring, Britain shall no doubt, armed. The British people will stand erect and they will face whatever is coming. 